study, we're going to deal first on the office work of the Holy Spirit. And the second section of the school, we will deal on the unpardonable sin. And these very things go hand in hand together because in order for us to prevent ourselves from committing the sin against against the Holy Spirit, the unpardonable sin, we need to understand what is the work of the Spirit and how that we are to allow the Spirit to do a perfect work in us, both to will and to do of His good pleasure, and that the unpardonable sin will never occur in, in any of our, one of our lives. Amen? So if you have your Bibles, I pray that you study along with me. If you have not your Bibles, you can just listen attentively and listen to what the Spirit saith. Amen? So our first text for this evening will be the book of John chapter 16, as we get right into the first section dealing on the work or the office work, the function of the Holy Spirit. John chapter 16 will be our first text. John chapter 16 is where we'll go to to start off this message. And of course, before I will go to the office work of the Holy Spirit, I want to lay the foundation as to who is the Holy Spirit and also certain characteristics based on scripture and revealed also in the spirit of prophecy, the writings of Ellen White concerning the Holy Spirit. But in order for us to understand what is his work and what is his function that is to be performed in our hearts and our lives. But let's go into scripture first. Amen. John chapter 16. And let's start reading in verse number seven, then in verse number eight. Amen. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. This is Christ speaking to his disciples. For if I go not away, this comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. This is talking about the Holy Spirit. But And when he is come, he will reprove the world or convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. So we here find one of the main functions of the Holy Spirit, who is called the Comforter, that his work is both to convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of, the, and of judgment to come. Now the question is, yes, something is convicting me of my sin, but the question is, what really is convicting me, or who is convicting me? It is the Spirit. But the question is, who is the Holy Spirit? Amen? The Holy Spirit is none other than the regenerating agency that God uses to communicate unto men. Greetings, greetings, sir. Greetings, welcome. The Holy Spirit is both the agent of the Most High as well as the representative of Jesus Christ. And it is this very medium, the Holy Spirit, that God uses, the third person of the Godhead, that God uses to communicate unto men and also to impart unto men knowledge from his word as well as things that men must understand in order to comprehend the work of Christ and how Christ is to be wrought both in the life and in the heart of the individual. But without the Holy Spirit, we will not have victory over sin. We will not have holiness in our hearts, in our lives, and we will not better understand the work of Christ and what Christ is willing to do for each and every one of us. And yea, even worse, we will not be able to discern Calvary because we're told that without the Holy Spirit, Christ's sacrifice, his death on the cross would have been of none avail. And I will show it to you. I'll read to you from the book called The Desire of Ages, a very powerful book. The Desire of Ages, the third volume of the Conflict of the Ages series. Amen. The third volume. The third volume, and I'll read to you in page number 671. Page 671 in paragraph number one, then in paragraph number two. Amen. The Desire of Ages, page 671, paragraphs one and two. I'll read the first one. It tells you, the Comforter is called the Spirit of Truth. His work is to define and maintain the truth. He first dwells in the heart as a spirit of truth, and thus he becomes a comforter. There is comfort and peace in the truth, but no real peace or comfort can be found in falsehood. It is through false theories and traditions that Satan gains his power over the mind. By directing men to false standards, he misshapes the character. 
through the scriptures, the Holy Spirit speaks to the mind and impresses truth upon the heart. Amen. Thus, he exposes error and expels it from the soul. It is by the spirit of truth working through the word of God that Christ subdues his chosen people to himself. So we're told, based on this passage, that the Holy Spirit is the one that maintains the truth and that defines the truth. If the Holy Spirit were not teaching this truth through his sacred, sacred, eternal truth, then how would the error, the sin that is in our hearts, be expelled from our lives? It is a spirit that does this work. It is a spirit that expels the sin from our hearts and that exposes error, that exposes the false doctrines and the false theories that are being preached at our pulpits at this present time. Because the Holy Spirit is the one that is against the false theories, the sophistries of Satan, the devil. And he is the one, the Holy Spirit is the one that God uses even today to convict sinners of their sins and of their evil, as well as pointing them to the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Without the Spirit, how would men be drawn unto the Savior? How would men be drawn unto Calvary? How would men be drawn unto the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world? It is a Spirit that does this work. And once we accept the truth in our hearts, once we accept Christ as our Lord and Savior, then the Holy Spirit will then become our comforter. And once we walk in the truth, we will experience both comfort and peace that is found in the truth. Once we are sanctified in the truth through obedience to the truth as it is in Jesus. Do you follow me? Do you understand the point so far? Amen? All right, let's keep going. Now the second paragraph. Of the same page, 671 now, paragraph 2. In describing to his disciples the office work of the Holy Spirit, Jesus sought to inspire them with the joy and hope that inspired his own heart. Amen? He rejoiced because of the abundant help he had provided for his church. The Holy Spirit was the highest of all gifts that he could solicit from his Father for the exaltation of his people. Ah, uh, you see? So the Holy Spirit is the one, in other words, that exalts us once we walk in all the ways of the Lord. Are you following me? Are you following what Sister White reads and writes? For the Spirit was to be given as a regenerating agent, and without this, in other words, without the regener regenerating agency of the Spirit, the sacrifice of Christ would have been of none avail. The power of evil had been strengthening for centuries, and the submission of men to this satanic captivity was amazing. Sin could be resisted and overcome only, notice now, through the mighty agency of the third person of the Godhead, who would come with no modified energy but in the fullness of divine power. It is the spirit that makes effectual what has been wrought out by the world's redeemer. In other words, the Holy Spirit completes that very thing that Christ had begun. You following that? Amen? It is by the Spirit that the heart is made pure or holy, sanctified, free from sin and from the things of the world, from the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Christ has given his Spirit, pardon me, I skipped a sentence, through the Spirit, the believer becomes a partaker of the divine nature. You see how wonderful the Spirit of God is? Christ has given His Spirit as a divine power to overcome all hereditary, transmitted from our ancestors or from our parents, and cultivated, something that has been relished or cherished by a single individual, tendencies to evil and to impress His own character upon His church. I'll pause here for a moment. Meditate upon those words. So the Holy Spirit is a divine or to express the meaning of the truth found within God's word and within his law. And he maintains the truth. He protects the truth and he defends the truth. And if we're filled with the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, we are also to defend the truth 
live the truth, and obey the truth. And we are to maintain it within our hearts just as the Holy Spirit does its very work. And just as the Holy Spirit is the representative of Jesus Christ, even so we, once we're filled with the Spirit, we too can be representatives of the Most High, of Christ, and that through the Spirit, we can become partakers of the divine nature. Amen. Amen. The Holy Spirit shows us our need for our Savior, shows us our need for God, and it shows us what we are lacking. Are you following me? And now notice the Holy Spirit is Christ's representative. And notice throughout Scripture, the Holy Spirit, at the Lady Foundation, is referring to a he. Amen? It's referring to a he. In other words, the, that pronoun he is a masculine pronoun. So we know that the Holy Spirit is, of course, a male. But at the same time, also in Scripture, is referred to by the pronoun it. So it's both an he and an it. Why is it called an it in Scripture? It, it because the Holy Spirit is a spirit. Yes, the Holy Spirit is a person, but at the same time, it's a spirit. Because Christ says in Luke 24, verse 39, that the spirit does not have flesh and bones as Christ right now has flesh and bones. Amen? That in itself is another study. I'm not going to deal on that. But the Holy Spirit is a third person. He is a person and he has a personality. And we're going to see in scripture, how is it that the Holy Spirit has a, has a personality that has feelings, it has emotions, it has senses. Amen? Just as a person has feelings, has emotions, and has senses. Let's prove that from scripture. Don't take my words for it. It's from the Bible. Amen? Turn, hold John chapter 16. We're, we're, we're going back there. Hold John 16 with your Bible marker or your finger. Turn me to the book of Romans chapter 8, verse 16. Romans chapter 8 and verse number 16. Don't leave John 16. We're going back there, but, but hold it. Let's turn to Romans chapter 8 and verse number 16. It's very important that we understand these things line upon line, precept upon precept. Here a little and there a little. Romans chapter 8 and verse number 16 and also in verse number 26. Let's read 16 first. It reads, the Spirit itself, again, in itself. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. What is Paul saying in this, in this verse right here? In other words, the Holy Spirit is a witness. What is a witness? A witness is a person who testifies what he has seen and heard. So in order to be a witness, you ought to have senses, specific senses. You have to have the sense of sight and the sense of hearing. Those are the two things that you need to be a witness. Do you understand that? That's what the Holy Spirit is. He is the testifier of Jesus Christ. He testifies what he has seen of Christ and what he had heard of Christ and also reveals to us. He is the revealer of eternal truth that is found within the holy, infallible word of God. The Holy Spirit will never reveal to us anything that God does not sanction and nothing which is against the character of the Most High and against the, char the character of himself, the character of the Holy Spirit. Amen? The Holy Spirit is a witness and is a testifier and the revealer of truth and not of error nor of falsehood. Do you understand that? All right, now let's read verse number 16. And Brother Reuben, welcome, brother. Thanks for joining in. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should what what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. So this verse tells us that the Holy Spirit has feelings. It has feelings. It has emotions. Now, as, as many of you have heard in times past and even now, there are individuals today who sincerely believe that the Holy Spirit is a force or is simply the power of God. 
I will submit to you that the Holy Spirit is not the power of God and is not a force. How is the Spirit of God a force if it has feelings? A force or a power does not have feelings or emotions. Amen? When Christ tells us that we are not to grieve the Holy Spirit, what does that mean? That means the Holy Spirit has feelings. It has emotions. How can you grieve something that is that is a force or that is simply a strength or simply a presence or simply a mere power? It makes no sense to grieve something that is not a person but simply a force. You see, you, 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 it's, it's why it's very important you need to compare these doctrines to, each, to the eternal word of God to see if these things are so. If he's speaking according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Isaiah 8.20. Amen? And that is just a side note. So these are the basic things of what the Holy Spirit is. The Holy Spirit has feelings, has emotions, has personality, and is a person. He is a faithful witness, a testifier, and the revealer of eternal truth. Amen? Now, let's turn back to John chapter 16. And you should, you should be there. I told you to hold John chapter 16. Amen. John chapter 16 is where we'll go back to again to continue in the thoughts of the work of the Holy Spirit. Wow, I didn't hold John chapter 16. Mercy. <laughs> but I'm back there now. Amen. John chapter 16. And let's read now in verse number 13. Very important. And most of us know what the Holy Spirit does in this verse. It reads, How be it when he, again he, the Spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, like a witness does, that shall we speak. And he will show you things to come. Amen. Now verse number 14. The Holy Spirit, he shall glorify me. For he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. How does the Holy Spirit glorify Christ? The Holy Spirit glorifies Christ by revealing the grace of Christ unto all the world. Just as Christ himself, the second person of the Godhead, the Son of God, glorified God the Father, the first person, by demonstrating the love of God and the pure, holy character of God unto all the world, yea, even to his own disciples. That's how Christ glorified the Father, and this is how the Holy Spirit glorifies Christ, by revealing the truth and the grace of Christ to all the world. But how is the Spirit of God going to do this? Through us, human instrumentalities, men who have like passions as other men have, and, and who have experienced the pitfalls of sin, and who have experienced giving into temptation, yielding to temptation, being tempted at all points, just as Christ himself was, though Christ himself had never sinned when he was tempted, through us, once we submit our will and ourselves into Christ, the Holy Spirit fills us. But he will not do that work if we refuse to surrender our will to the will of God. Amen? This is how fair God is, because we can't give God our heart if uh, or in other words, God cannot have our heart if we do not give unto God our hearts. Let me put it that way. Amen. If we refuse to give God our hearts, how can he fill us with his spirit? It's, it's, it's almost like saying this. It's like I have a gift and someone else has a gift, right? And I want and that gift, I want to I want to give this gift unto someone, right? But because of pride is in my heart. I do not want to give that gift unto that person, but I expect that person whom I'm refusing to give that certain gift of whatever it is unto that person, that's that's being unfair. If I if if I don't give that gift unto that person, yet at the same time I expect him to give something to me, that's being unfair. That's being proudful. That's being selfish. And so does of God and us. God cannot give something to us if we do not give something unto him first. The prerequisite, follow me now, the prerequisite of us being filled with the Spirit, God giving the Holy Spirit unto us, is, is when we first had to give unto God our hearts. 
Are you following me? Is it is it is it understandable? If it's if it it is, type amen, or say yes, or continue to, to tap hearts on the screen as I keep saying amen. Is that is it plain and simple? Because we want to, we want to be on the same page together. Because if we don't give God our hearts, He will not fill us with His Holy Spirit. Plain and simple, and not hard to understand. Amen. So this is basically the office work of the Holy Spirit. But the only thing that we cannot comprehend of the Holy Spirit is his nature. We can't, we can't say what the Holy Spirit is like or what he looks like or, any, or any, of that, any of that stuff. We can't comprehend his nature. And that is something that is not revealed in Scripture in which God purposely does not reveal. That is a mystery. And to prove that to you, I want to read to you from the book called The Acts of the Apostles, the fourth volume of the Conquer of the Ages series, in page number 52, paragraph number one. Amen? Acts of the Apostles, page 52, paragraph one reads, The nature of the Holy Spirit is a mystery. Do you understand that? The nature of the Holy Spirit is a mystery. Men cannot, cannot explain it because the Lord has not revealed it unto them. Men having fanciful views may bring together passages of Scripture and put a human construction on them. But the acceptance of these views will not strengthen the church. Amen? Regarding, amen, Sister Karen. That's very true. Amen. You're very right. Regarding such mysteries, which are too deep for human understanding, silence is golden silence is golden if you don't understand the nature of the holy spirit simply stop talking about what the holy spirit is like or what his nature is like greetings sir welcome thank you for joining it is best for you to be silent upon the subject of the nature of the holy spirit because that is a mystery that is not revealed in scripture the secret things belong to the lord our god but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forevermore. That's Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29. Amen? So don't say, oh, the Holy Spirit looks like this or that. Or the Holy Spirit, the, the, the His nature is in such a manner or an X, Y, and Z. If, if you hear preachers or pastors saying these things, shun them. Don't listen to them. They are just fanatics. Uh, I hate to say that, that F word. But it's a truth. Please, don't listen to these false prophets that, that say such things. As Sister White said, silence is golden. Zip it. Amen? Stick to that which is revealed, but not that which is a mystery. Sign out again, and I'll leave that alone. So, now we understand from Scripture the office work of the Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit is going to do in each and every one of our lives. But there is something that can stop us from the Holy Spirit working in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And that one thing that hinders the Holy Spirit in doing this work is the unpardonable sin. So now let's be the transition from the first section, now the second and last section of this message and study. And this one is going to be a little sobering one because of what we know it to be very well the only sin that God cannot forgive, the unpardonable sin.